Thank you, Catherine. So I first want to say that the first presentation was just beautiful, and I'm so excited to see frizzled receptors in the spotlight today. Um, and then I also want to start by thanking you for this acknowledgement. Um, it's quite an honor, especially when there are just so many out other outstanding papers that are published in development every year. So I'm excited today to talk to you about um, our collaborative effort looking at frizzled 2 associated congenital malformations and a successful therapeutic intervention. And as mentioned, um, there were three first co-authors, um, Ryan, myself, and Sanika. And so I do wanna start by acknowledging um, the members of the Stotman and Williams Labs. So I am in the Williams Lab at the Van Andel Institute and um, I'm in the lab of Bart Williams. And um, we are a wind signaling lab and we became interested in the context of frizzled 2 in rare disease. And in looking through the literature, we identified that Rolf's lab was um, the first lab to identify frizzled 2 variants in um, the syndrome that we're going to be talking about. And we were curious to see if he was still working on it. So we reached out to him and found that there was a good collaborative potential to work on a similar um, mouse model. We were both kind of working on similar things. And so um, you can see some of the members of, or some of the authors pictured here. The work was done um, in the Stopman lab at Cincinnati Children's and he has since moved to Nationwide Children's Hospital. And um, I would like to acknowledge the core facilities that were used at both uh, institutes, and then, of course, our funding sources. And so I'll get into it. Um, there's a little bit of a debate in the field about um, how we want to classify these syndromes, autosomal dominant omodysplasia or Robino syndrome or both. And um, I'll kind of get into it a little bit, but you might hear me use omodysplasia or Robino syndrome interchangeably because um, a beautiful paper in 2022 found that if you look at uh, the different variants that have been detected in frizzled that were classified as omodysplasia or Robino syndrome, they kind of they sort of align, and so it's thought to that it's actually one um, one syndrome, but. Um, before I get too far into that, I'll describe kind of what the phenotypes that we see are in these patients who have these, um, these syndromes. It's essentially, it's a congenital malformation syndrome in which the um, craniofacial structures are affected as well as the limbs. And so what you can see is that the um, arms and legs are shortened in these patients, and sometimes the digits are also shortened, called brachydactyly. And then in the craniofacial um, bones, we see shortening of the maxilla mandible, upturned nose, wide set eyes, and um, oftentimes patients have cleft palate. And then they are um, sometimes missing ribs and sometimes have genitive urinary anomalies as well as cardiac defects. And so um, what interests us in <clears throat> these syndromes were their relation to the wind signaling pathway. And so you can see here, these are um, different genes that have been identified to be um, affected in patients with Robino syndrome. And so they, Robino syndrome has both a recessive and a dominant inheritance pattern. You can see Frizzle 2 is, is dominant. And so we're going to focus today on uh, the Frizzle 2 variants that have been detected in Robino and um, autosomal dominant dysplasia, and how we've modeled these in mice to better understand them. And so I mentioned that Rolf's group was the first to identify a variant in Frizzle 2 in a patient with the, um, the autosomal dominant omodysplasia. And you can see here the patient has um, distinct craniofacial features as well as shortening of the limbs. And uh, it was already beautifully presented by, by Ling, the um, kind of how, what frizzles look like, there are seven past transmembrane receptors. The N terminus is where the wind binds, and the C terminus is where disheveled binds. And um, this is great because I don't have to go into a ton of detail, but we also were focusing kind of on the C terminus here in this disheveled binding domain, this KTXXXW um, sequence. And the, the variant that uh, Rolf's group detected was this tryptophan stop variant in this disheveled binding motif. And so this um, led to a, a of this C terminus. And it, to just reiterate that this is an, an autosomal dominant, so this is a heterozygous uh, variant. 
So since the first paper um, identified Frizzle 2 variant in these patients, multiple other papers have been published that have identified variants in Frizzle 2. And so I'm just going to highlight that there are some um, uh, frame shift mutation up in the uh, N terminus, as well as some missense variants and um, other premature stops. And these have varying different um, clinical significance. Some are still uncertain significance, conflicting interpretations, and that have been classified as pathogenic. And so we will be focusing on that first variant that was detected in, in these studies. So um, we had several unanswered questions about Frizzle 2. We were first curious as to whether we could model these Frizzle 2 variants in mice. And if so, could we use these models to determine what the mechanism um, of action was? And then would it be possible to intervene using a therapeutic approach? And so I'll kind of over, do an overview of the methods that were used. Uh, Rolf's group used zygote microinjection, which is kind of the gold standard for developing genetically engineered mouse models. And this is where you have a super ovulated female that is mated, the fertilized eggs are collected, and then using a microinjection setup, your CRISPR-Cas9 reagents are injected directly into the pronucleus of the fertilized egg, and then those are re-implanted into pseudo-pregnant females. Our group used um, iGonad to generate some of the variants, and iGonad stands for Improved Genome Editing via Oviductal Nucleic Acid Delivery, and this is um, a more recent um, method to develop genetically engineered mouse models that really makes making these models a little bit more approachable in the sense that it decreases the cost, time, and some of the equipment required to, to make genetically engineered mouse models. And so we um, mate a male and female, and the next day we do surgery directly on the pregnant female, exposing the oviduct and injecting the CRISPR-Cas9 reagents directly into this region where the fertilized eggs are, the, where the zygotes are, and then use um, electroporation to create pores within the zygote so that the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 reagents can um, get in and cause genome editing. And then we allow the, the female to recover and then either harvest embryos or allow them to go to um, live birth. And so this is our targeted targeting strategy for Frizzle 2. As I mentioned, that tryptophan stop was at position 548 in human. In mouse, it's at position 553. So we'll be using this, um, new, this number uh, going forward since we're working in mouse. And to target this tryptophan here, we identified a, um, a good guide sequence just upstream of it, which um, had a PAM sequence, which actually ended up being the tryptophan stop which is um, great because we'll have to uh, mutate this anyway, so that will help prevent future cutting by the Cas9. And then regions of homology of, of about eight, um, 80 base pairs on either side of this. So if edited, this is what the sequence would look like. We um, would see a tryptophan stop here in this position. And then we do alter a few of the nucleotides upstream and downstream so that the amino acids remain the same, but they can prevent the guide from, um, from recognizing the sequence and prevent uh, further cutting. And so I'm going to um, describe the different alleles that were generated. So this is the wild type frizzle two, and we'll zoom in to the C terminus because this is where we're, uh, this is our target region here. Reminder that this is that disheveled binding motif. And the tryptophan stop that we um, were in, um, intending to generate would look like this with a um, stop where that tryptophan was and a truncation of that C-terminal tail. There was a um, two unintended indels that were developed, the D3 allele, which is where the serine is, um, is deleted with a three base pair deletion which causes one amino acid shortening of the C-terminal tail. And the D4 allele is a deletion of four nucleotides, which leads to a frame shift, um, which causes an extension of that C-terminal tail. So I'll mostly be focusing on the um, intended target, this W553 stop, and the D4 um, elongation phenotypes. So this is the first figure of the paper, just uh, another way of showing what I already showed, the um, target region here being this tryptophan at position 553 in mouse, and then this is what the sequence would look like if um, the intended target 
was generated, the D3 um, allele here and the D4 with the four um, base pair deletion. And then this is just what the um, amino acid sequence would be. You can see that extension of the, the tail here and the D4. So I'm gonna start by focusing, um, we're gonna go a little bit out of order for the paper, but start focusing just on the tryptophan um, stop variant. So you can see here with the Singer sequencing, um, when this is, is as a heterozygous, you can see the wild type sequence and the um, variant sequence overlaid. And uh, we can see that it was um, accurately modified. And then looking at the actual mice here, these are E18.5 embryos with wild type on the top and the modified um, embryo on the bottom. You can see that the tryptophan stop variant has um, shortening of the face. And then using micro CT, which looks at the bones of the skull, we can see a shortening of the nasal bone, maxilla, and mandible. And then looking at the palate, we see 100% um, penetrance of cleft palate in these animals. And then this is just a cross section through the palate showing that incomplete closure. The palatal width was increased in these variants and the body weight was, um, was decreased. And so when we looked at the limbs, um, you can see through skeletal prepping, which um, stains the bones with purple and the cartilage with blue and um, micro CT, which shows just the, the mineralized tissue, we can see that the tryptophan stop variants had significantly reduced length of, of the limbs. And this is all measured here over the body weight. I should mention that there was a moderate and a severe phenotype in the um, tryptophan stop variants. And um, I don't think we know completely why that is, but uh, it's something potentially to explore these two um, different phenotypes. So the next question we had was whether or not um, signaling was disrupted and how it was disrupted in these animals. And there's sort of um, two arms of a, the WINT pathway, a canonical and a non-canonical. We're actually moving away from that nomenclature. Canonical just means that it's beta-catenin independent. Non-canonical means it's not beta-catenin independent, of which there are many different pathways. And so really it's a beta-catenin um, pathway or um, specific to whatever pathway you're talking about that's non-canonical. So I'm going to be talking about um, beta-catenin and PCP pathway, which is the planar cell polarity pathway. What is um, interesting about FRISL2 as a receptor in the pathway is that it can actually um, participate in both the um, beta-catenin and the planar cell polarity pathways. And so um, on the left here, beta-catenin dependent, uh, you have a Wint, like a prototypic canonical WINT would be 3A, which engages a co-receptor LRP56 with Frizzle 2, and that allows for um, binding of disheveled and binding of this um, complex that allows for beta-catenin accumulation, which will affect a proliferation and differentiation. The PCP pathway will use kind of the prototypic WINT is a 5A WINT, but there are other, um, other WINTs that may be involved with a co-receptor that may be RIC or ROAR, and then Frizzle 2, again, can participate in this, and this will um, lead to downstream signaling that affects cell polarity and cytoskeletal reorganization. So because the, um, the mouse embryos are have cleft palate as heterozygotes, we can't maintain a mouse colony. And so every time we want to look at more of these tryptophan stop embryos, we need to generate more of them. And so this is where the IgoNAD technique really does come into play because it's something that allows us to more rapidly um, and more cost-effectively make more embryos. And so what we did was we performed IgoNAD and allowed these to go to E12.5 to generate cells, um, mouse embryonic fibroblasts, so that way we could use um, tissue culture to look at signaling in these, uh, these tryptophan stop embryos. In culture, we added a porcupine inhibitor for 48 hours to prevent their own secretion of WINTs so that they can just respond to whatever WINT stimulus we give them. Serum starved them for 24 hours to sync up their cell cycles. And then we added condition medias. We added a 3A condition media for more of a canonical and a 5A for more of a non-canonical signaling harvested cell lysates, and then performed Western blood. So to orient you, the um, first signaling that we'll look at is canonical. These are wild type MEFs, tryptophan stop MEFs, treated with control condition media, 3A or 5A condition media, using active beta-catenin, 
or phosphorylated LRP6 as readouts of uh, the beta catenin uh, dependent pathway. You can see WNT3A increases active beta catenin and phosphorylated LRP6, and it does so as well in the in the tryptophan stop um, mass. And you can see there's no alteration in baseline levels of these uh, these proteins. And so we can conclude that in these um, tryptophan stop MAFs that we don't see any altered canonical signaling. If we look at non-canonical readout using uh, phosphovingle 2 as a, a readout of um, planar cell polarity, what's interesting is that um, 3A and 5A both increase phosphovingle 2 levels in, in wild type. And you do see an increase um, in the tryptophan stop variants with 3A and 5A condition media, but the baseline levels of phosphovingle 2 are decreased. And this is statistically significant as measured here. Um, we had seven wild type MAFs and seven uh, mutant MAFs. You can see that they, even though they respond, they don't, they don't get up to the level of that wild type um, response to 3A and 5A. So I'm going to go back. Um, we're going to now talk about the D3 and D4 unintended um, indels, and but um, talk about some exciting data from them. So the first uh, piece of data was to just look at weaning numbers when crossing these uh, D3 or D4 variants with wild type animals. So you'd expect to see a 50% um, wild type and 50% het offspring. In the D3 allele, there was about a 50-50 split. And in the D4 allele, there was a significant decrease in the amount of heterozygous animals um, that were weaned, suggesting that as heterozygotes, there may be some perinatal lethality. Now, when we cross a heterozygous D3 to a D3 or a D4 to a D4 and look at embryos, you'd expect a one to one split, which you can see over here. The D3 and D4 had a um, close to expected uh, split between wild type het and homozygotes. But what became very interesting to Rolf's group when they designed or um, were studying these is that if you looked at weaning, um, weaning animals, there were no homozygotes that were detected as weanings. So this is suggesting that homozygotes could not uh, survive past birth. So I'm going to only focus on the D4 allele from here on out. The D3 is all in the supplemental data. And I just want to um, point out that the heterozygous variants did not have any um, statistically significant phenotypes here, but they did have, um, uh, the homozygotes have a widening of the palate, which is quantified in J. They had 100% penetrance of cleft palate, which is um, seen in this uh, figure in I and then quantified in K, and then a shortening of the mandible, which is seen in N and quantified in, in O. The homozygous animals also had shortened limbs. So this is again, phenocopying the human. Um, syndrome. And so what we see here, a skeletal prex again with the, the purple color being the bone, we see a shortening of the, uh, the limb structures in both the forelimb and the hind limb as quantified as a um, over the weight of the, each individual animal here, all statistically significantly decreased in length. So now, um, are, do we have altered canonical and non-canonical signaling in, in these animals? And because these animals, we could maintain a colony as heterozygotes, um, we could actually look at signaling directly in the tissue. And so um, Rolf's group, they um, took lysates from the developing palate and used axon-2 mRNA and DKK1 um, as readouts of canonical or beta-catenin dependent signaling and saw significant reductions in that arm of the pathway. And then if we look at chondrocytes, so um, developing cartilage to, uh, cells in the long bones of the animals, we can measure the size of the cell, the length to width ratio. So in chondrocytes, you expect to see a flattening of the cell in a wild type animal where your length is larger than your width. So there's a higher length to width ratio. And then if PCP or planar cell polarity is disrupted, the cell becomes more circular shaped, having a low, uh, shorter length, causing a decrease in length to width ratio. And so um, this is quantified here. Panels A through F are in uh, the hind limb and G through I are in the forelimb. And you can see that the D3 
D4D4 um, homozygotes had statistically significantly decreased length width ratios, suggesting that planar cell polarity was disrupted in these animals. So this is kind of the exciting part of the story where we talk about using um, a therapeutic intervention. And so, um, as I mentioned before, the canonical arm of the pathway signals with a co-receptor LRP56. When um, signaling is happening, you have an accumulation of beta-catenin. If we inhibit LRP56 with um, DKK, which binds to LRP56 and disrupts signaling, we have a phosphorylation of beta-catenin and degradation, um, leading to a decrease in canonical signaling. Now, there is a small molecule inhibitor called 3C3A, which um, inhibits the inhibitor, which allows for an um, accumulation of beta-catenin and allowing signaling to increase. And so the hypothesis was that increasing canonical signaling may rescue the phenotype. So we first made sure that this 3C3A was active in vitro and saw that at increasing concentrations of 3C3A, we had an increase in um, the uh, top flash, which is a readout of canonical signaling. And then this is the exciting experiment here where 3C3A was administered through an IP injection at embryonic stages E10 through 14 to, directly to the pregnant female. Embryos were harvested at E17.5. And if you look at panel or images in panels D and G, you can see the shortened limbs in D in the homozygotes. You can see the length is rescued here in panel G in the homozygotes treated with the 3C3A small molecule inhibitor. And this is all quantified down here, a statistically significant increase in, in limb length. So our conclusions are that Frizzle 2 variants are um, able to phenocopy the human syndrome if we make them in mice, that canonical and non-canonical wind signaling pathways are altered in the D4-D4 animals, um, and it appears just the non-canonical may be altered in the tryptophan stop, and that 3C3A treatment in utero rescued the limb phenotype in the D4 animals. So for our future directions, uh, the Stopman lab wants to continue to expand on this therapeutic intervention studies. They wanna test out different dosing strategies um, and get a better understanding of the mechanism of action. Is this just affecting canonical signaling or is it potentially also affecting um, non-canonical? And potentially in the future, extending this to other genes that are associated with, with Robinow syndrome. For our lab, we intend to continue to use iGonad to test more variants in Frizzle 2, as well as some of the other associated genes to get a better idea of pathogenicity of some of the variants. And then we want to expand as well on mechanistic studies. Um, we're focusing on post-translational modifications of Frizzles. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Megan, for another great talk. Um, please do type any questions that you have into the into the Q&A box for Megan. And, and while we're waiting for those, um, I've, I've actually got a couple of questions. I'll start out with um, with one, which is I was interested in the, the difference in phenotype or severity of the, I think it's the D4 versus the W553, because from what I see looking at your, your figure, everything downstream of that is it the, the disheveled or the PDZ interacting domain in the D4 is is kind of junk, right? It's not related to the 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 canonical, the normal protein structure to sequence rather. So why why do you think the D4 is is better than the W553 stop? Or have I misunderstood that? So um the D4 allele still has a significant reduction in limb length as a homozygote, but as a yes, heterozygote. This, yeah, exactly. Right. It's the yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the homozygotes are more similar to the <clears throat> heterozygous tryptophan yeah. stop variant. Yeah. And I, I think it's potentially because just as you're saying, the this sequence here is still um present and able to bind the um the disheveled. But if you look back here, I'll, I'll pull up the other ones. Um, you actually have that 
sequence present in the tryptophan stop as well. Yeah. But what you're missing though is that C-terminal tail. And what's at the very end of that is a PDZ binding domain, which is also important in signaling. So it's possible that missing that is um, causing a more severe phenotype in this, pre in this truncation phenotype. But uh, that kind of complicates things because this sequence is all altered here in the D4. Yeah. So you don't have that PDZ binding domain. So I'm I'm not fully um, sure why it's it's causing these different phenotypes, but it's super interesting and something something to definitely look into. Um, we in the supplemental material when our lab used Igonad to make the tryptophan stop variants, we also got a bunch of off um, target unintended. Uh, indels as well. And we have a whole list of, of ones that caused cleft palate or didn't cause cleft palate. And so they were just various different missense mutations or frame shifts. And some of them did and some of them didn't. I think that that's super interesting to tease that information out. Yeah. And then the other question I had was, was regarding the, the potential therapeutic uh, intervention. So this is just uh, sort of generic uh, injection of your drug. And so presumably you're overactivating wind signaling everywhere um, right. rather than mm -hmm. just re rescuing or hopefully rescuing uh, those specific phenotypes. So do those mice, um, I realize you're sort of harvesting embryos and I also realize this is Rob's work, but sort of do those mice show other defects as a result of potential overactivation of the wind pathway? You know, um, that would be a question for Rolf. I don't believe that they ever let the animals go to live birth, but I don't think they had any gross um, changes other than looking at the limbs. I do believe that the cleft palate um, phenotype was not completely rescued with the 3C3A. So it could be a titration um, thing too with the, with the dose that maybe it was um, just enough to affect the limbs, but not as much elsewhere. But I agree. Um, their wind signaling is crucial during these developmental time points. And so you do have the risk of potentially affecting um, heart development, lung development, other, other aspects of the, the developing embryo. So good question.